Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Shannon and today I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers for this collaborative presentation brought to you by Family Law Now and the Collaborative Practice Institute that will be focused on the intersection of family law and real estate. The CPI is a community of collaboratively trained lawyers, financial professionals, business valuators, writers, educators, trainers, bloggers, presenters, and family professionals. Their focus and commitment is on advancing professional and public knowledge about collaborative mediation and all forms of family alternative dispute resolutions, encouraging deep discussion and a review of CP issues and building a relationship amongst business owners and managing partners. So um, before I get into introductions of our panelists, I'll just let you know um, what they'll be focusing on today. So they'll be discussing advantages of collaborative practice, best and or fairest selection process for joint real estate opinion and appraisal. Why might you want or not want to sever a joint tenancy? How to protect your right to a date of marriage deduction on real estate owned prior to marriage? And they'll be talking about when to have an expert calculate notional disposition costs. Should you have independent or jointly retained real estate counsel act for the sale of a matrimonial home? Who is responsible for carrying expenses of the home if a spouse vacates? Can a spouse of possession change the locks? When might someone be deemed to have more than one matrimonial home? What is the best way to resolve a dispute over whether to accept an offer to purchase the matrimonial home? How can a business valuator assist? What to do if one party is dragging their feet on selling a matrimonial home? And lastly, clients buy buys a home and now hurry up and get the deal done. So that's what they plan to cover today. I'm mean, also is, that is an ambitious agenda. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Lots to cover. Talk about it. What were we thinking? <laughs> how, how long did you say we had? 15 minutes. No, oh, I'm joking. We'll go. go as long as we need. We'll get out everybody's <laughs> questions answered today. Um, and now before I pass things over, I don't want to take too long, but I do want to take a moment to introduce our panelists. So first we have Carrie Heinzel, who is the founder of Fairmore Family Law Financial Solutions. Fairmore offers independent fact-based financial analytics and settlement insights to individuals and couples working through separation and divorce. Carrie is also the current president for the Ontario Association of Collaborative Professionals. Thanks for being here, Carrie. Sure. Next, we have Jonathan Painter, who is a registered social oh. worker works in the family law system as a collaborative family professional in private practice. Jonathan is also on the board of directors of the Ontario Association for Family Mediation, holding the executive position as treasurer of the board and is on the board of the Collaborative Practice Durham Region. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. Next, we have uh, Jason Kwiatkowski, who is a founding partner and the president at Valuation Support Partners Limited, a professional services firm specializing in providing the business and legal communities with business valuation, litigation support, and exit planning advisory services. Jason assists the collaborative process as an independent financial neutral by providing business valuations and income assessments. Next, we have Natalie Derbyshire, who is a partner at Santieri Family Law in Toronto. She has been practicing family law since 2006 when she was called to the Bar of Ontario. Natalie is determined to practice family law with a view to improve dispute resolution options for her clients and empower them with the knowledge to make good decisions to foster, uh, in so far as possible, financial stability, long-term peace, and happiness. She is also a certified collaborative practitioner and aims to save clients money, primarily recommending dispute resolution processes, such as collaboration, mediation, and negoci negotiation as alternatives to court whenever prudent. Hi, everyone. Hi, Natalie. Thanks for joining. Next, we have Mark DeRue, who practices family law as a partner at Riley & Partners based in Ajax. He has been he has many years of family law experience and is a trained collaborative family lawyer. Whenever possible, he prefers out-of-court resolution of family disputes using mediation and collaborative practice to help clients resolve their issues in a cost-effective and amicable way. He is a past director of Collaborative Practice Durham Region and also a member of the Collaborative Practice Institute and Collaborative Divorce Toronto. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mark. 
And then next we have Russell Alexander, who is the founder and senior partner at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers. With over 25 years of experience, he uses his knowledge and expertise to serve his clients in all aspects of family law and supports them through the transition of divorce and separation. Russell has written four books on separation and divorce and is a fully trained collaborative practice lawyer. He speaks at conferences on collaborative practice, marketing, technology, and the law. So on that note, I'll pass it over to you, Russell, to get started with the presentation. I know we have a lot to cover in the next hour, so I'll let you get to it. Well, let's get at it. we got a lot to cover off here. So we talk about collaborative practice, and this, this presentation is brought, uh, brought to you by the Collaborative Practice Institute. Mark, what's collaborative practice? What do real estate agents and brokers need to know? First of all, collaborative practice is a voluntary dispute resolution process, uh, which is for separating spouses. And it has the goal of negotiating a mutually acceptable separation agreement. And generally, we use interest-based negotiation in doing that. Uh, essentially, the process is one where each of the spouses retains a collaboratively trained lawyer and usually these days we use a collaborative team, which also includes a neutral family professional and a neutral financial professional. And essentially their roles are to assist the team in dealing with their areas of specialty. So the family professional is someone who's a trained therapist and they generally can help with parenting uh, plans. They can help deal with a lot of the emotional issues that typically occur between the spouses and that the lawyers generally are not really well equipped to handle and that the lawyers uh, often find are, are real barriers to settlement. So they assist with that. The family professionals help the lawyers and the clients to gather up all the necessary financial information. They will collate that and prepare financial statements and basically will assist the clients in understanding what some of the financial options are so that we can then move the case towards some kind of a settlement. Um, the advantages that I find with the process are number one, that it's typically a lot less expensive than litigation. Litigation is uh, typically, you know, it takes place in the Superior Court of Ontario, family courts. They are very badly bad, uh, backlogged in a lot of the jurisdictions. So the cases there take a long time. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of uh, mandatory court attendances that all add to people's expenses, and they're not necessarily useful for a lot of cases. Uh, other than the expense, an advantage is that the process is private, so that your personal business doesn't become part of a court file that any member of the public is entitled to go to the court and order up. Uh, it's a process that can be conducted at the pace that works for both of the clients. So if they want to go slowly, they can do that. If they're both in a big hurry because something is happening, somebody wants to get remarried or someone has bought a house or something else, you can really expedite it in a way that you can't do with court proceedings. Um, the process is one that is very flexible. So you can Taylor make it for the clients. Uh, in particular, when uh, when we were all struggling with the COVID uh, epidem epidemic pandemic, uh, what we quickly did in collaborative law is we switched to doing everything online. We were quickly conducting settlement meetings with clients online with all of the professionals involved. And uh, that's worked so well that a lot of that has carried forward. And I find that most clients still prefer to do it that way. Um, and then finally, the big advantage that I find with the process is that the clients control it. Uh, they control the outcome, they control the process, and they do that uh, in, in a way that, you know, makes it easier for both of them to participate and ultimately makes the uh, outcome uh, something that's acceptable to both of them unlike court where you've got a judge who's simply imposing a decision on people. Uh, so those are, those are some of the advantages that I see in the process. Yeah, that's a great summary. Thank you, Mark. And part of the reason why we wanted to bring this, um, this presentation to you, the real estate agents and brokers is because we're always getting lots of questions uh, 
from real estate agents, you're on the front line. Sometimes you're dealing with the home even before the spouses have completed their separation. So you're probably gonna see a lot of this conflict. So one of the questions we often get is how do we value the home? Maybe one person wants to buy it out. Maybe they want to put it on the market. Really four things I tell my clients, um, I encourage them to reuse the real estate agent they used when they bought the home. Ideally, they have a relationship with that person. Hopefully uh, they'll, they'll trust that agent's opinion. The, uh, there's a really different, different steps you can take. The first step is the, par you know, the parties or your clients agree on what the value of the home is. It's usually the most efficient way. Clients are sophisticated now. They've got Zillow and access to the MLS. They know what their neighbor's house sold for down the road and how it's similar or dissimilar from their own. So they usually have a fairly good, good idea in terms of where the market is. Uh, most real estate agents tell me all the clients think their homes are worth $100,000 more than what the market will dictate. So that's sort of something you need to manage as agents and brokers. But if they can't agree, Oftentimes, the next level up is we would ask uh, the clients to get a real estate agent's letter of opinion, and maybe you've provided these letters to your clients, and, and, or they'll get two or three letters, one or they'll both get a, a letter from somebody they know, and then we compare the letters. Oftentimes, that gets us fairly close. Sometimes, a real estate agent may say it's worth more to try to get the listing, um, so you want to be mindful of that. Sometimes, if you're not an arm's length, uh, with the client, they may say, well, you're too close to that client or you're a related family member or friend and you're juicing the numbers high or low. Uh, I, so we see that a lot as well. The next level up would be get a certified real estate appraisal done. There's a specialist in your community that do this kind of work. When I'm doing a, a certified appraisal, I try to use somebody I know who's been to court, who's testified before, uh, whose opinion will be um, certified by the court. They'll be permitted to provide expert evidence to the court. When it gets to that level, that level of involvement, usually there's a little, little or no trust between the spouses. They haven't been able to agree. So what we'll do, this is a process that works for us. You can use whatever process you want. One party will come up with three names and the other party will pick one of those names or flip it around. And usually that you'll, you'll agree on a common appraisal so you can hopefully agree on the number that comes out. The final step that's available for you is the sale of the home pursuant to Partition and Sale Act and get a court order for the sale of the home. Ultimately, the market will decide what this property is worth. A lot of disadvantages to your clients if you do that. Obviously, there's gonna be notional uh, disposition costs, there's gonna be commissions, legal fees, Maybe a penalty you have to pay to get out of your mortgage. Um, so these are things you want to think about when you're counseling and, and giving advice to your clients in terms of coming up with a value for the home, whether they can agree on it, what a lawyer is likely going to tell them, and what a court's probably going to do if there is no agreement. So when we want to sever or not sever a joint tenancy, uh, now what do real estate agents need to know about this issue? So firstly. If you own a property as joint tenants, the surviving joint tenant has an automatic right of survivorship. What does that mean? That means that the joint tenant who survives the other receives 100% ownership in the property. So you might want to sever the joint tenancy to end that automatic right of survivorship. Why is that? To ensure that beneficiaries get a share in the property without relying upon a partner or perhaps um, at the time of divorce or separation, this is when we frequently see people inquiring about this. It may be a, a goal that both spouses want or only one spouse is interested in, but you don't need the consent of your spouse to sever. You will need a real estate lawyer to sever the joint tenancy for you. Um, also for tax or estate planning purposes, this may be something that's worthwhile for you. Uh, to protect an interest in a property from creditors is another reason why we hear people inquiring about this. And ultimately to ensure beneficiaries get a share in the property um, through their estate 
um, if they don't have a will, but we always recommend to our spouses that they should get a will upon separation. And you'll need real estate counsel, as I said, to perform this task. So your family law counsel can often provide you with a referral for same. Yeah, and you know, this is sad, but I've had clients who are terminally ill and they sever it. They want their share of the home to go to their estate and not to their spouse because they've made provisions in their will for the property to flow somewhere else. So a really important issue. Now, lawyers, and we've got a quite we've got questions coming in. Thank you for sending them and let's get to a couple of them right now. What if one spouse doesn't agree to sell and the other one's unable to buy a man? How long does it take for a court to get a ruling? Um, what if somebody contributed larger sale? Well, Partition and Sale Act, the court can probably do that on a motion. I don't think it'd require a trial. Might be a few months before you get an order for the sale of the home. And if there's a dispute over how the proceeds are gonna be uh, divided, I would suggest, Mark, you just put it in trust or you pay it to the court until the court decides the matter. Is that what you would do? That That's exactly what I would do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about data marriage deduction for real estate owned prior to the marriage. Only lawyers talk about this kind of language, but let's get our mind around this concept of a data marriage deduction that and what the real estate agents and brokers need to be thinking about uh, when they're helping their clients. Well, the first thing I would say uh, to people who are wanting to protect their right to have a date of marriage deduction in real estate is it's a good idea to think about getting a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement before entering into marriage or uh, before living with someone. And the reason for that is because you can actually fence off property that you don't want to equalize or divide with your spouse down the road. Um, you may want to keep evidence. It's prudent to do so as of the date of marriage, which uh, demonstrates the value of that property. So, for example, you may want to have a fulsome market comparison done by a real estate agent, um, or you may want to get a certified appraisal, as Russ had mentioned, which is um, often considered the gold standard in terms of um evidence that the court will accept of fair market value. You should also think about obtaining from your real estate lawyer a copy of the parcel register, which details the date on which the property was purchased and how title was taken. And also, um, you may want to inquire with your bank about any mortgages or charges that were registered on title against the property as of date of marriage. Certainly your spouse would be interested um, in any debts or encumbrances registered against title because that would decrease the overall net equity in the home and overall uh, deduction to which you may be entitled. Yeah, you know, a, a simple way just if you brought a house into the marriage, that becomes a matrimonial home subject to division, so you don't get the deduction. But what it, Mark, when it might just tell your client, sell that house and buy another one. That's no longer the that's, that's the no matter the no longer the matrimonial home. You got a new one. So the first one you brought in, you get the full deduction. That's the other thing you can do, exactly. Right. Um, so, but but it is it is really important that people consider doing a marriage contract. And, yeah. and if they're not going to sell the house, then you really need to in order to preserve that deduction. Yeah. And uh, the way the Family Law Act works is that there, there is a special rule for the matrimonial home so that if you if you enter the marriage with a home that's worth a million dollars and you paid for it entirely yourself before the date of marriage, and it's worth two million when you separate, you got to divide that full two million. But if you've got a stock portfolio worth a million dollars and you separate uh, and it's worth $2 million, you only share with your spouse the increase in value, so the $1 million. So it's really a huge savings if you get that marriage contract in a situation like that. But if you had that million-dollar home, sold it and bought another one, during the course then you of could, marriage, you get a deduction. For then you could preserve it. You don't have to share it. Yeah. So what we're saying is talk to a lawyer and have your clients talk to a lawyer to make sure you understand how the Family Law Act works because it's a little bit tricky that way. Um, we're going to get into some notional disposition costs, but just before we got another question that came in. 
common law rules in Ontario with regard to real estate. Well, that could be a whole nother presentation. <laughs> you know, you have constructive resulting trusts. Yeah. Married couples equalize property. Common law couples do not automatically. So you need to make a claim to the court based in equity. So a trust claim, a joint family venture claim, it, it can still be successful, but I would say it's a much harder role to follow. Wouldn't you agree, Matt? when you're not subject to the family lock? Absolutely, because there's a defined regime in Ontario for property division for married spouses as opposed to common law spouses. You need a significant paper trail of evidence in order to demonstrate that you've made contributions to property um, in terms of sweat equity, financial contributions, renovations, improvements. Mm -hmm to uh, real estate in order to potentially have an entitlement to some form of compensation. Yeah, yeah. Great question though. Please keep the questions coming in. Let's talk about notional disposition costs. Jason, what are they and what the real estate agents and brokers need to know? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So in a separation, the family assets and liabilities need to be valued, right? And summarized for purposes of equalizing property. And these are all summarized in what we refer to as a net family property statement. And the net family property statement allows for a deduction for the liability associated with a future sale or disposition of any of the assets that are included in the net family property statement. And, and these notional disposition costs, like just think when you sell or dispose of an asset, you incur income taxes. There may be selling costs, right? So that's what we're primarily talking about here is is the income taxes that you'll realize when you eventually dispose of the property. And so these assets could include real estate if it's not the principal residence, then especially if it's corporately held um, and businesses that brings me to businesses, but it could also just be investment portfolios or RSPs or any type of asset that would incur in taxes on disposition. A lot of families have rental prop properties they rent out too, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's beneficial to have a financial expert or someone sort of knowledgeable in this area assist with those calculations because, you know, certain assumptions need to be made with respect to the timing of a future disposition and the tax rates that will be sort of incurred on the disposition. And in the case of a business, you know, it, assumption regarding the sale of assets versus shares, there's different tax consequences. So... That's okay. why you get an expert involved. I don't know if Carrie has ever gets involved in these or has any further comments. Yeah, all the time. Uh, especially right now, we're seeing uh, a mass rush for people to sell their secondary properties, whether it be a rental or a cottage, thanks to because the, of the capital gains. Yeah. yeah, as of June, uh, June 25, the new capital gains rules will be coming in. Uh, so that makes it a little bit more interesting for people, but we're definitely, we want to look not only at what is the cost of selling your property, but also, you know, what are those tax implications going to be on the future, for, especially for secondary and tertiary properties. We, we have to look at all of those things. So it becomes important. And also we want to look at if somebody's saying, I have no interest in selling this property ever I want this cottage to be handed down to my children and my children's children. Maybe we need to look at something different when we're looking at disposition costs. Maybe we're not including them because they're not actually going to be realized until this person has long passed and it's going to be their kid's problem or their grandkid's problem or somebody mm -hmm. else's problem down the road. So just because we're calculating it, it is a negotiable area when we're looking at final settlement. Yeah, and I want to thank our audience for sending in these questions. They've been fantastic. Keep them coming in. Okay, so you got you you've got you find you got a listing, right? You, somebody's hired you to sell their home. We've talked about how 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 can it be valued if they're disagreeing. We've talked about the importance of title, how it's being held. We talked about date of marriage deduction and some issues that may arise for your clients. Jason just talked a bit, and Carrie just mentioned notional disposition costs. This could all seem a bit overwhelming, but Mark, should you have an independent or jointly retained real estate agent for your clients when they're selling their home? What's your advice and, and recommendation? Sorry, real estate agent or counsel? We had, sorry, I was talking, I was gonna talk lawyer, about counsel. Real estate counsel, lawyer, not agent. Yeah, 
Yes. So, um, so basically, in my opinion, as long as each of the spouses already has their own independent lawyer representing them, I don't have a problem with one lawyer acting on the real estate transaction. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, it's cheaper for both of them. And it's, uh, it's more efficient. Uh, I, the only time when I would recommend they have separate councils where maybe one person is unrepresented and you've negotiated something with them. And then you really want to make sure that the, there's no conflict and that there's no possibility of conflict. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a great tip. Uh, great questions coming in. Thank you. Can division of property and other stuff be done through the end of the separation or is there a limitation period? Uh, Nat, there's a time bomb for you. Do you want to tackle mm -hmm. that one? So with respect to property, if we're talking about assets like real estate, business interests, stocks, bonds, GICs, bank accounts, then yes, there is a limitation period of six years from the date of separation and two years from the date of a divorce. If you're talking about contents, that's a, a separate issue altogether. People often decide that they want to flip a coin and divide contents on a you take, I take basis, um, simply to avoid the excessive costs of having lawyers involved, uh, typically not worth the cost of a toaster. Yeah. Sometimes I'll get involved in negotiating those uh, contents as well as a family professional to help mediate, you know, who gets what and, yeah. you know, limit the amount of conflict the couple is experiencing while going through that process. Well, there's emotions behind the toaster, so of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The toaster was a wedding gift from, you know, someone's great aunt or something. Yeah. That $2,000 couch you bought at the brick five years ago <laughs> that has a stain on it is not worth $2,000 anymore. So whatever somebody's going to pay for it on the side of the road. So you don't want to be paying your lawyer hundreds of dollars to deal with it. That's what you're saying, right, Nat? Correct. And and honestly, we've seen an increase recently in people also wanting to negotiate settlements over pet um, care schedules, not just parenting schedules, but pet care schedules. So that's another uh, quasi property issue that may come to us. I've had clients argue over one of these expensive Kirby vacuum cleaners. Husband wanted, really? wife said he never vacuumed during the, at all during the marriage. So husband said, oh, I really, really want it. And wife says, well, he doesn't even have any carpets in his place. <laughs> it's not a bit the vacuum cleaner. So that's when you want to hire a collaborative lawyer to help you work through the other issues that are going on. Okay, so yeah. we've got, you, you, you're helping this family sell their home. We've gone through all these steps. We've now secured an independent real estate lawyer to help you with the process. What about carrying costs of the home? So what if one of your client vacates the home and the other one's in there? Uh, what should we be thinking about, Carrie? Can we can we adjust for that? And what are common things we look at? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when we're in collaborative process, one of the things that we ask clients to do is maintain the status quo. So however you were managing your finances before you got into this process, we'd like you to maintain them. And we'll work around and, and down the road how that will happen. Um, and how things will get adjusted for. Where things can kind of go a little bit sideways is somebody's decided they're going to move out and now rent somewhere. So now we have one person living in the home or maybe one person and the children living in the home. Support may or not be being received at this point. So what will end up happening is we will suggest that the person, the two of them will share the cost of the mortgage the property taxes and the house insurance, that will still be at a 50-50 because they're going to get the benefit of a 50-50 split of that matrimonial home. But the person living in the house, we're going to say, well, you're going to be responsible for the consumables. So heat, hydro, water, all the things that they're consuming over time. We normally tell people if this is, if it's, if we're in collaborative, we will adjust for any overpayments or underpayments that are made by anybody. We'll adjust for all of that as we're going through the process. Easiest thing, maintain your status quo until your legal counsel and your collaborative team can get you to that spot. We don't want people stopping doing things or ruining other people's credit ratings or anything like that as we're going through process. Just keep it going. You guys have a vested interest in this home. We don't want anything to happen to damage that interest 
or to damage your credit as you're going through it. You're going to need good credit at the end of this. Yeah, and just, you know, oftentimes there's a child or spousal support claim that may mm -hmm. not get paid as well. So you may, sometimes those are set off to a degree, yeah. carrying costs and support claims that need to be addressed as well. And, and right. budgeting, we, here's the, that's the other part of it, Russ, is we'll do budgeting because some people go, I don't know if I can afford this. So we're happy to do some budgeting for them. Let's forecast and see what you can do. Yeah, exactly. We get this question a lot. Changing the locks. Can I lock him out? Right? He's got he's gone over to his new partner's house. I'm gonna switch the locks. Sometimes it happens same day. It quite, you know, not as dramatic, but sometimes yeah. you know, stuck is thrown on the line and the locks are changed. Mark, yeah. what yeah. if you're well, a real estate agent and the that, client is asking, can I change my locks? Yeah, so that question does come up a lot and it Number one, you got to distinguish between people who are legally married and, and those who are common law. If you're legally married under the Family Law Act, the house that the couple is normally living in is defined as the matrimonial home. And neither spouse can lock out the other one from that matrimonial home uh, because you've both got an equal right to live there, even if one of the spouses is a 100% legal owner of the property. Uh, the only way you get around that is, number one, uh, if the spouse who is, if, if one spouse moves out and they waive their right to uh, their right of possession in a written agreement, then the other spouse could change the lock. Number two would be if somebody went to court and they got an order for what's called exclusive possession, uh, in which case then they would, they, they would be the only spouse allowed to live there and they could change the lock because the other spouse is no longer allowed to live there. Um, or, you know, if both spouses consent to changing the lock, then, you know, they could do that. Um, but it's, it's something you really got to be careful with. Mm -hmm. If people are common law, then technically whoever's the legal owner can control the property and do whatever they want with it. Uh, but the one thing you do have to be careful about is that the other spouse might have a trust claim against the property. So it might be a circumstance where, uh, you know, sometimes people for financing reasons will put a property in one person's name, but both of them really contributed to it. And then when they break up, the person whose name's not on it might bring a claim that the first person who owns it holds part of it in trust for them. And then in that case, technically they could go to court and they could assert a right to have access to the property as an owner of it, as a beneficial owner of it, rather than as a, uh, a spouse uh, to a matrimonial home if they're legally married. So that's, again, something where I would advise you to get the advice of a lawyer for the particular circumstance mm -hmm. if it comes up. Tough question, Nat. What do you tell your clients when they ask you about the locks? Um, so it depends on the situation. I would say for the most part, I, I agree with Mark. It's always prudent um, to avoid changing the locks unless you have real grounds to do so. So um, if it's a circumstance of domestic violence and somebody's perhaps uh, been charged criminally and, you know, the court is um, going to determine that criminal matter, that may be a basis for changing the locks, particularly if there is a restraining order or a recognizance of bail um, that exists. So it's really a case by case, fact by fact type of scenario where we have to be careful with what we advise. What I hear you saying, it depends. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a tough question. Last thing you want to do is have somebody call the police. Please don't have the time or resources to be dealing with this. Ideally, there'd be agreement between the lawyers in terms of who's going to enter the home. If somebody's left the home, maybe providing notice when they're coming back and a reason why they're coming back. Uh, I kind of think of the idea of possession, right? Like if it's recent you know, within the last 48 hours, probably not. If the other spouse has taken off for five, six months, I think, you know, that that client has a right to privacy as well, right? So um, it, it's certainly a tough one. We've got some audience questions coming in. One of them is, what if a primary caregiver is leaving them at home but makes far less than the person staying? Well, then you'd be looking at a support claim in that situation. And we've got a question here about an estate uh, claim. Do you want to handle that, read out the question and answer this one, Mark? Yeah, so the, the question says, when doing our wills as joint tenants, 
the lawyer said that in death, the direct ownership to the surviving person can be challenged, insisted on language in the will, which stated that the property goes to the surviving individual. Is this the case now? So I'm, I'm not exactly understanding what, what happened here, but what I can say as a general rule is, uh, because I, I do wills as well as part of my practice. And if you've got a property that is jointly owned, you usually don't try to deal with that in the will. Um, the, the problem with, with dealing with that property in the will uh, is that there's some case law to the extent that if you make a designation of a jointly owned property in a will, it could in some circumstances be seen as severing that joint tenancy. So it could actually have the opposite result to what you want, um, you know, basically an unintended consequence. So if there's a jointly owned property, you generally don't deal with that because you assume it's going to go to the other spouse. And the only thing that the will is going to speak to is in the alternative, if, if you are the last survivor, then, you know, in most cases, people are leaving it to their children or some other relative. Um, but I, I don't really understand why that lawyer was suggesting that it would be challenged. It, uh, that doesn't quite make sense to me. Uh, if the person who asked the question has more details and they want to send that to us, then I could I could look at that as well. Good. But we're thinking about the right things, right? You know, these are all potential uh, outcomes and things you want to talk to your clients about. So we talked about the Family Law Act and that there's special rules regarding the matrimonial home. And we talked a little bit about the deduction you get. But now, can you have more than one matrimonial home? That doesn't really make sense uh, to most people. <laughs> but I think the answer might surprise our audience. Absolutely, you can in Ontario. Um, when you ordinarily occupy more than one property on the date of separation, whether it's a cottage, a seasonal property, a timeshare, a chalet, somewhere where you go periodically, um, you may have it deemed to be a second matrimonial home, um, particularly if both spouses have access to the second property. Um, if they attend it together or separately um, is also a fact that can be considered whether or not you have a uh, family attend at that property with you. Um, and why is this significant? Because you will not qualify for a date of marriage deduction, as we had mentioned earlier, if you own real estate that is deemed a matrimonial home. Um, also, if you are gifted or um, if you inherit property during the course of the marriage that becomes a matrimonial home, you may lose the right to an exclusion. So real estate um, may be deemed a matrimonial home, even if only one spouse is on title. Common law spouses do not have a matrimonial home, as Mark said earlier. Only married spouses are deemed to have uh, one or more matrimonial homes. And again, you may want a marriage contract or um, a cohabitation agreement if you're planning on living with somebody or marrying somebody to protect you and fence off any particular property. So if you're, you're a real estate agent or broker and you have clients who are inheriting property, cottages or otherwise, you want them to make sure they get good legal advice and if they want to keep that excluded. These these heritage, co heritage cottages have been in a family for three, four generations, and all of a sudden it's gone because it becomes a matrimonial home. That has huge ramifications for the family unit. Oftentimes, uh, the families won't talk to each other anymore. It affects the children. It affects grandparents having relationships with the grandchildren. Huge, huge difficult problem for uh, family lawyers and professionals to try to find a common ground and resolution to. So really, really important stuff. Thinking that. Russ, right. if I, Russ, if I can interject, I just yeah, want to please. remind people that just because something's deemed a matrimonial home does not mean it's a primary residence. There's a difference between those terms. So right. primary residence is where you primarily live, um, usually is the matrimonial home. The other residents that you own that may be deemed as matrimonial, they are secondary residents and they are subject to things like capital gains and all of those right. fun things. So just wanted to make sure that clarity was there. That little tidbit of good news for our audience members. The yeah. actor. <laughs> The, and just but, one one further point, if you don't mind, Russ, because yeah, no, this is important. Very, subject for sure. very gave me a light bulb moment there. I once had a client ask me 
if a lease will protect them um, in terms of a uh, second matrimonial home not being deemed to be same? And the answer is no. The short answer is you need a marriage contract or a cohabitation agreement to fence off property. So don't think that a lease will protect you. And the case law is kind of surprising. It doesn't take much to trigger it, right? You can go to the family cottage. I've had one of these. It was an island cottage on uh, Stony, Stony Lake up in the Quarthas. It's only like a two season cottage. They don't, they can't get there in the wintertime. They would only go there for five days or a week or two in the summertime. That triggered it into being a matrimonial home, even though it wasn't accessible year round. So it doesn't take much. Uh, okay, so we've now talked about all these things. We've talked about multiple homes. Your clients have now got an offer to purchase their home, but they can't agree whether to accept the offer to purchase. We've all seen this. Um, and I'm sure as real estate agents, you deal with this probably two, three times a day. Uh, Mark, how do we resolve these issues? Um, well, the, the first thing is... Uh... You, you always hope that, uh, you know, the, the real estate agent has prepared both of the clients so that they both have a realistic expectation of what they're going to get. That's that's the first thing, because they, they need to have heard that in advance so they know what's coming down the, you know, down the, the road. Uh, but if they can't agree, and, and some people will never agree on anything, then, uh, you know, I would suggest, number one, that you try a collaborative process. Um, and you could even even if they weren't previously involved in collaborative process, you could do a process just to deal with one issue. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that might be something where you would involve, you know, each of them would have a collaborative lawyer and maybe you would actually involve the agent there or a couple of agents to get some expert feedback from them as to whether this is a reasonable offer and suggest that uh, and, and discuss that with the, uh, with the lawyers present. Um, if you can't resolve it through collaborative process or mediation, then the other thing that people can do is if, if they're in litigation, you can bring a motion, you can get an order for the acceptance of the, of the, uh, of the price. Um, you know, I've had to do that before. And, and basically you need to take evidence to the judge, uh, as to the history of the property. So they're going to want to know what, uh, Know how long it was listed for, how many offers there have been, what the suggested list price was, and uh, probably they'll want a letter from the realtor to say that they believe that this is a reasonable price to accept, and then the judge can order that. And so that's the that's the way of bringing the hammer down if no one can resolve things uh, amicably between them. Yeah, usually when it gets to that point there's sometimes already been an order for the property to be listed for sale or there's some kind of agreement. I build into the language of the order. So we get is that the parties are required to follow the reasonable advice of their real estate agent, including accepting offers and price reductions. So if you go to court over that dispute and you know the, the real estate agent's advice is reasonable, there's gonna be consequences for the person who's not behaving. And I really like your comment, Mark, about, you know, bringing these conflicts into CP. Oftentimes, I'll get a, a client who comes in who's been in court for two years, and I'll, I'll explain what the collaborative process is. And they tell me, had somebody told me that at the beginning, I would have never gone to court. So it's really something I think is super helpful for people to explore. So Jason, business valuators, what do they bring to the table? What do real estate agents need to know? Yeah, so business valuators in Canada are referred to as CBVs or chartered business valuators. And they get involved in the collaborative separation process, typically whenever there's a business interest as a financial neutral that specializes in business valuation. So they can assist in a, a couple of different ways. One is on the property side of things. You know, if there's a business, the business needs to be appraised. So that's the obvious one. Also on the property side, like we talked about earlier, they can assist with calculating disposition costs associated with the value of the business or the property. Um, but they can also assist on the income side of things. And on the income side of things, here we're talking about support, right? And 
Income is to be calculated in accordance with the federal child support guidelines. And it's pretty easy if you just have someone who's an employee somewhere. But it gets a little more challenging and complicated if there's a business involved. So CBVs get called in to determine the spouse's income for support purposes when there's a business because all the perks and benefits associated with business ownership, they need to be taken into consideration. So that's how you can get a, a, a CBV or a business valuator involved. With respect to real estate, I think it's important to note that CBVs don't specialize in real estate appraisals. We don't, we don't appraise or value real estate, but what we do is we value the shares of a company that holds real estate. So anytime there's a real estate holding company, we are often asked to value the shares of that business. So that's an important distinction. Yeah, good tool to have. Thank you, Jason. All right, so we've talked about clients who are refusing to accept an offer, but what about if the real estate agent or broker has a client who wants to sell, uh, but their his or her spouse is dragging their feet and doesn't wanna play nice in the sandbox. Jonathan, how can we help the real estate agent get through that problem. Yeah, so that's where um, you know the lawyers and and maybe one of the financial neutrals will uh, bring a family professional or a mental health professional into the team to help um, manage the emotional issues that are causing that roadblock. So you know when couples are separating, um, they often, almost always, not always, but almost always move at different paces. So the person who's deciding to leave the relationship may have decided years or months before, um, and the other party is playing catch up. Maybe they don't want the separation. Maybe they don't want the person to leave. Maybe they get so much uh, benefit from having that person in the house still that they uh, are dragging their feet uh, and preventing the sale of the home. So my job would be to go in and, and help address these emotional issues that are causing the roadblock um, and try to, you know, uh, help the client emotionally move through uh, the separation process so that all the other tasks that the team has to do can, can go more smoothly. Um, and so, you know, that's where my job gets really interesting and challenging and stressful. Uh, try and deal with these emotional issues and and manage any conflict that's arising from uh, one person's lack of uh, progress in this process. Um, and and on occasion, um, uh, you know, the the party just won't move, no matter what I'll do. And at that point, the the party who wants to sell the house will have to take it to court and get the court to force the sale. Jonathan, you know, real estate agents got the MLS agreement sitting in the living room with these warring clients. What tips do you have for the agents in terms of trying to get, uh, you know, how would, how could they approach that environment if they think there's going to be some conflict about somebody dragging their feet? I think that one of the things that a real estate agents can do is kind of learn to recognize the signs of an emotional issue that is causing this roadblock. Uh, maybe asking some curious questions of the parties, like do you have a counselor? Do you have family members or friends who can support you through this? Uh, making sure that those emotional issues are uh, addressed because um, you know when someone's going through a separation, they're not always acting as a rational being, right? They, they might um, engage in some behavior that's very irrational and maybe even not in their own best interests. But um, so that's where you would bring kind of an expert on psychology and mental health into the uh, into the scene to help address some of these underlying emotional issues. So um, what I would suggest real realtors do is have a list of good people that you know of that you can refer really quickly to. And, you know, maybe, um, you know, every community has its own um, group of psychotherapists and social workers and psychologists. Um, maybe, a, you know, take some of these folks out for coffee and just get to know them a little bit um, and develop that trusting relationship so that you can refer them quickly to someone that you know and you trust and, and you, you know, you know that they're gonna help you uh, 
uh, work on this issue. So um, that that would be my biggest um, um, suggestion for realtors. Great tip. One of our audience mes mentioned uh, in our real estate practice, we send in two agents to the transaction. That way, each seller has someone to speak with. That's kind of interesting. That's clever, yeah. You've got yeah, somebody in your court. So um, yeah, yeah, I could see you know the client saying, "Oh, you're just." you're working for him. You're not listening to my concerns. Mm -hmm. so, great tip. Thank you for that. Okay, Carrie, client buys a home. Hurry up, get the deal done. I need the money. Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> yeah. like this, right? They got another house they want to buy, but yeah. they're on their capital of this one that's not moving. What do we do? Or what do you do? What do you recommend? <laughs> uh, my first thing is usually I go, oh no. Um, and then I call the lawyers and I go, so we found a little bit of a situation going on here. How fast can you guys take? Uh, that's usually part one. Um, it actually becomes really interesting. Obviously, the first thing I want to know is where did you get the money for the down payment? That's my first thing because you always have to put that money down. Um, the next thing I want to know is how long is your close? So if they tell me it's a three-week close, it may be something where who do you have that can bridge you over until we get this deal done? Um that's part of it. It's and it also it depends where we are in process. If we're at the very beginning of process and they've done this, the advice might be you're gonna have to find a way out of this deal because what you're doing is we may not have pension valuations back in time. There may be other things that we just can't get fast enough for that deal to be done. If we're getting closer to the end of the deal then what can end up happening is we can sit there and start looking at our timelines. What, what needs to happen? What has to happen? And how can we do this? But like I said, my first thing is where did you get the money for the down? Because my first concern becomes what happened? Where did the money come from? Did you take it from a line of credit? Do we need to do an adjustment for it? Did you take it from a joint asset? So like an investment account, do we need to do an adjustment for that? Did you did you not disclose something? And so all of those things become a part of it. And it ends up being a little bit deeper digging. It means a whole lot of faster action on this part. If people are going to buy a house, I really seriously suggest, and they're in the throes of it with their agent and they're looking for places, you need to let us know that this is happening. You need to let us know what the timelines are. Don't let them get into something that's 30 days or less. Uh, mainly because they may not have the turnaround time and you may be losing the deal. And there's people like John Paganakis and other uh, mortgage brokers with collaborative practice training. Yeah. They can be fairly creative in coming up with solutions to put in financing when you're in this type of situation. Is that right? Absolutely. And the other thing that people have to keep in mind is that if you bought this house and you're a support payor, it does affect your ability to get mortgaging. So one of the things that they look at really deeply is this idea of spousal support. So if you're paying a large amount of spousal support, it is going to affect how much you're going to qualify for. Child support, yes, but maybe not as much. If your kids are 18, about to go off to university, they may be looking at that going, this is short term. It's not going to be that big of a deal to your debt ratio. But if we start looking at long-term spousal support, it's going to have a big, big impact on what you can and can't buy. Yeah. Okay. So this is our first industry specific presentation by the Collaborative Practice Institute. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Still a few time, a few minutes left to get your questions in if there's something you want us to cover off. But let's do a sort of rapid fire final thoughts, tips and tricks and takeaways for agents and brokers. And then uh, we'll bring this train into the station. You want to go first, Nat? Yeah, I just wanted to um, add to my previous comments that if you are going to have a marriage contract or cohabitation agreement in place, I strongly recommend that over time you review it because you may need amendments down the road if uh, there are contingencies or things that you haven't considered when you first negotiated that agreement. Also, you will likely want a provision in your cohabitation agreement that clearly states this contract will be deemed a marriage contract upon marriage. Upon marriage. <laughs> yeah, that that that's really important. And I, I can tell you, I was involved in a matter where there was a marriage contract that was not very well drafted. 
And then the parties went on and they changed their whole situation so that it then became a recipe for litigation when they separated. And specifically what they did is the agreement referred to one property. They then changed that property and then also bought a cottage and they did some funny things with the financing between them, which then led to huge arguments as to who actually owned what percentage of what pro property and how, if at all, the agreement now actually dealt with these two new properties. So it, it can't be stated strongly enough that you really do need to review these on a regular basis. And particularly if you change any of the main items that you have tried to deal with in that, uh, in that agreement. And these kitchen table agreements or agreements you find on the internet, they just, it keeps the lawyer's kids in private school. They're terrible because they get set aside. It involves two years of litigation. It's usually, there's a number of errors. Very rarely do they stand up unless, um, unless it's, you know, unless they're sophisticated uh, individuals, but even then it's going to take a year or two to decide if it's going to, is, if it's going to be upheld by the court simply get it done correctly the first time. I agree with both of you guys, great tips. Okay, uh, a couple quick questions and we're gonna do our rapid fire. Will the recording be made available? Yes, we will make a recording of today's event available to everybody. Can you please clarify, what's the difference between an actual marriage or common law? Nat, you wanna kick, take a swing at that one? Well, with a, an actual marriage, you are getting a uh, marriage registration um, and license, marriage license. Um, typically, there's a ceremony uh, and you have your marital certificate, which is required, by the way. We need the original when you're applying for your divorce. The court will want it along with your divorce application. Common law spouses are people who choose to live together, typically in a conjugal relationship. Yeah. And the late, great Phil Epstein, family lawyer, was asked, when does the common law relationship start? He says it starts when the toothbrush shows up. So <laughs> it doesn't have to be very long before you're considered in common law relationship. Um, Carrie, here's one we're going to send yeah. your way. Child support, would a lender consider the cost would decrease when a child goes to university tuition, housing, this and that? Yeah, usually the what they're looking at are the payments that you have to make to the other individual. That's what they're focusing on. So what is your legal obligation to that other person? It's not about an obligation. Not everybody will pay for their child to go to university. They may have an RESP, so they may already have that savings there. They may also have their child is doing OSAP. They may be getting scholarships. There's a, so they don't, lenders don't have a tendency to look at those costs. They want to see what are you legally responsible to be paying to another person on a monthly or periodic basis. So that's why that becomes important. And in the collaborative setting, we can be fairly creative, right? So if somebody's trying to get financing and their support payments affecting that, we might we might transfer some capital or an equalization, larger equalization payment and lump sum out, maybe the spousal support claim to enable that financing to occur. Like we could be fairly creative in terms of getting over those hurdles, right, Carrie? Absolutely. And one of the easiest ways for some, a lot of people to keep their matrimonial home is by doing things like a spousal support buyout. It's how a lot of people are able to keep their homes and it allows people to still have that nice clean break and yeah. uh, everybody's getting what they want and their golden interests are met. So great questions. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Now we're going to go into the rapid fire. Final thoughts. We bring the train into the station. I'm going to go to Jonathan. You want to start us off? Uh, yeah. Keep in mind that um, uh, there's a great synergy between the collaborative team and realtors. So making those connections will really help your uh, practice from our side on the collaborative side, but also for the realtors. So um, yeah, don't don't hesitate to reach out to us and make those connections. Yeah, and a question just came in. How can real estate agents connect with collaborative professionals? How do they do that, Jonathan? Um, so you can check out uh, the OACP, the Ontario Association for Collaborative Professionals website. They have a long list of all the people that are members. Um, you can check out our site, uh, CP. Um, uh, actually, I, I don't remember off the top of my head yeah, what exactly our website is. 
yeah, that's right. Yeah. So maybe Shannon can post that in the chat for everyone to see. Um, you know, anyone on this uh, panel today, feel free to Google us and, and connect with us through our website or whatever. But uh, yeah, there's lot, lots of ways of connecting with us. Jason, final thoughts? Yeah, I think if you're a real estate agent, broker, lawyer, whatever it may be, uh, I think it's important to spread the word about the collaborative process. I mean, as an alternative to staying out of courts, because everyone knows people, has clients, friends, colleagues um, that are going through a divorce. And this is the better way. Yeah, great. Well said. Mark? Uh, yeah, I, th I think for me, the, the main takeaway, I think, should be that you, you should remember that the collaborative process is really flexible and it's it's really one that can deal with all of these sorts of issues that we've talked to you about. And particularly, I, I recall a file I had with you, Carrie, where we had this situation where someone had bought a house mm -hmm. and we had, you know, I think we had four weeks notice or five weeks notice. Um, and they, they bought it before they went to the lawyers to say, we want a separation agreement. Mm -hmm. And what we were able to do is we were able to very quickly uh, set up a collaborative meeting where we dealt with that house issue and we were able to set up a a, uh, a partial separation agreement that allowed the financing to go through and the transaction to close and prevented the person who put in the offer from potentially being sued for failure to be able to close that deal. So, uh, so yes, feel free to contact any of us if you've got any uh, family law related matters and, and we're all happy to help. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Nat? Yes, I, I echo the sentiments of all of my uh, peers here, and I would just add, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us on LinkedIn, network with us, invite us out for coffee, we're very friendly folks, and <laughs> it's good for us to have a reciprocal relationship, um, because knowledge is what allows us to bring value to our clients, respectively. And we're all looking for real estate agents, right? We all have clients selling their homes. Uh, Carrie, final thoughts? Yeah, just uh, my final thoughts are, you know, for the real estate agents, asking your clients if because you're going to be one of the first people they tell that they're thinking about getting divorced is asking if they're working with legal counsel. If not, you can obviously point them in the direction of collaborative, which is a better way for them to go. Um, but also as they're going through process, making sure that they are talking to their team that's handling their separation divorce so that everybody's on the same page. And that there's that open line of communication. Good communication means that we're all going to get through the deals a lot easier and a lot faster. Yeah, I agree. So I want to thank our panelists today for contributing their time and expertise. And our host magically appears. Welcome back, Shannon. Thank you. And thanks so much um, to everyone on the panel today for joining um, and sharing your knowledge and expertise. I also want to thank all of our attendees today for all your participation. It was very valuable to have your, your perspective and questions come in. And it looks like you covered everything in the hour and still were able to answer a lot of questions. Uh, so thanks so much again, everyone. <laughs>